We've got folks rolling in. We'll get started in just a moment. We just went live about a minute ago. Pretty exciting day to talk with Dr. Munoz. I'm not gonna, gonna try not to be completely on the day's news, Philip, because you've got so much to offer us. But uh, I think that's gonna come up a little bit soon here. Emily, if you can tell me, what do you think? We're ready to go here. Hi, Patrick, this is Katie. Yeah, I say um, start whenever you're ready. Wonderful. So my name is Patrick Campbell and we've got Dr. Philip Munoz here from Notre Dame, Indiana ready to talk with us about his wonderful new book, Religious Liberty and the American Founding. I've got that blurred, so I'm gonna to have to figure out how to unblur that, but you saw it in the uh, title here. Um, I am so excited because I am both intimidated and because of partner, partisanship. And I'm intimidated because Dr. Munoz's curriculum vitae is literally 13 pages long. So rather than take up the first half of this, uh, you can see that he's got um, degrees from Claremont College and Boston College and Claremont Graduate School, his PhD in political science, which might be a little surprising since he is a professor both at the University of Notre Dame Law School and in the political science department. I find that uh, really challenging. He's taught at Princeton, he's taught at Tufts, he's taught in Seattle University, NC State, Pomona College, Cal State San Bernardino. I'm probably missing some, but I think we can hit three quarters of the states for a constitutional amendment if we put in his conferences and uh, the places he's given lectures. Uh, the awards, gifts, and grants, I'm not going to cite that because that would take me about five minutes. He's been cited by the Supreme Court of the United States at least four times. He is most excited. I'm leaving this for last, Philip. Founding director of the Center for Citizen Citizenship and Constitutional Government. Um, I just love that. Citizenship and Constitutional Government. So that's my intimidation, the quick run through. And I really find Philip Munoz descriptive. I, I think um, at this time where we get so much partisanship, his description of the founding era is just wonderful, um, especially uh, religious liberty and the founders. So um, welcome, Philip. Can you say hi to us from uh, uh, probably the cold plains of Indiana? Yeah, it is. It is cold. Well, thank you for having me. I, it's a pleasure to be with you. And thanks for all the participants who are joined in tonight or who might be watching online. It's, uh, I'm, I'm uh, a big fan of James Madison, as you uh, might imagine, and have long um, worked with Montpelier. So I'm, I'm just thrilled to be with you tonight. Wonderful. And we do have the chat feature that we would love it if you could use that to put in where you're dialing in from. Um, maybe a city and state would be really helpful to us. And we will use that to help guide this discussion. There's so much to talk about today. Um, I thought I'd start uh, Dr. Munoz with a relatively easy question and a um, little bit biased here, Philip, uh, biased audience. So I'll give you a true false. James Madison, architect of the Bill of Rights, true or false, and why? Uh, true, uh, true for the most part. Let me put it that way. And let me just add, I just opened my Chapman window, so I'm seeing all the uh, places where people are uh, watching from. This is great, from Virginia, from North Carolina, from Delaware, from California. So it's great. Um, this technology is just amazing that we can all be together. Yeah, so the question is, is James Madison the architect of the Bill of Rights? Um, yeah, that's mostly true. I mean, we certainly wouldn't have the Bill of Rights as they exist uh, today um, without James Madison. So it's true in the most sense, but 
you know, he, um, he didn't simply write the Bill of Rights. You know, he, he made proposals, he was the driving force, uh, but Congress debated, you know, the text and he won most of the battles. You could say he won the war, but he didn't win all the battles and the language was changed a little bit. So it's not just him. So my follow-up to that, I think I'm quoting Dr. Philip Munoz. The people who wrote the Bill of Rights didn't think they were necessary. Mm. I just, I, I'm, as a guy who works at James Madison's Montclair, I find that fascinating. Could you tell the audience why the people who wrote the Bill of Rights did not think they were necessary? Yeah, yeah. so this is a little uh, known uh, historical fact. Uh, let me back up a little bit. Um, this audience probably knows this already, but um, just in case for those who don't. Um, uh, at the, when the Constitution is drafted, of course, it's drafted in Philadelphia, uh, summer of 1787, and it's um, you can still go to Independence Hall. I imagine many uh, of the members of the audience have been to Independence Hall. So they, they hammer out the draft of the Constitution in uh, um, closed doors, closed windows, as it were. And then uh, the document's published, and then, uh, as you know, it, it needs nine states to ratify to go into it. And so we have these ratification debates and ratification conventions. The party that's in favor, or the people who are in favor of the constitutional ratification are the called the Federalists, and the people against ratification of the Constitution are called Anti-Federalists. Now, the, the Anti-Federalists didn't like those names. The, the Anti-Federalists said um, the people against ratification should have been called the Anti-Rats, and the people for ratification should be called the Rats. And so, uh, so there's some big issues between now, most everyone, I think, is safe to say, thought the Articles of Confederation were not working. But the Anti-Federalists, th those against the Constitution, thought the new Constitution was uh, dangerous for all sorts of reasons, um, gave too much power to the central government, uh, took away uh, or limited the states in dangerous ways. And probably the most effective argument of the Anti-Federalists was that the Constitution lacks a Bill of Rights. Uh, the Federalist response was, no, the Constitution is a Bill of Rights. If uh, you teach the Federalist Papers, that's Federalist 84. Uh, and James Madison, I'm sorry, James Wilson in Pennsylvania said the same thing. Uh, so they said the Constitution is a Bill of Rights. What, what, what do they mean by that? Federalists said, look, the whole structure of the Constitution, representation, separation of powers, independent judiciary, everything we wrote in the Constitution is meant to protect individuals' rights. We don't need a Bill of Rights. And the nature of the federal constitution, the proposed national constitution is one of limited delegated powers. Uh, uh, it doesn't make sense to limit certain powers when the whole thing is limited already. The nature of the federal constitution isn't one where you need a bill of rights. At least that's what they said. Well, the anti-federalists were not persuaded. <clears throat> Sorry to go on and on here. Um, and a sort of deal was passed as it were. Um, uh, the Constitution will get ratified, and uh, then we'll have amendments. And so this gets the Constitution over, uh, over the last hurdles, gets ratified. Votes were very narrow. Um, the vote in New York, um, people don't remember this, the vote was 30 to 27. You know, two random New Yorkers, you know, the 57, vote no against the Constitution. And, you know, New York doesn't ratify, and if New York doesn't ratify, well, then, you know, the new Constitution is doomed sort of amazing how close it was. So anyway, so the Constitution was rat ratified and uh, uh, it's the first Congress and fe the Federalist Party members dominate the first Congress. And James Madison, who's in the first Congress says, uh, hey, we promised the, those anti-Federalists we'd amend the Constitution. We need to draft amendments. And all, all his fellow Federalists said, no, no we never, we, why draft amendments? We're just, we're getting the government up and running. We don't have time to do it. And anyways, we never thought that amendments were needed. Remember, don't, don't you remember all those arguments we made why the constitution doesn't need to be amended? Doesn't need a bill of rights? And, and what Madison understood was if amendments were drafted in the first Congress, the Federalist party would control the text of those amendments. What we've forgotten is the anti-Federalists, they didn't really, they didn't want a bill of rights. They wanted a second constitutional convention because they wanted to rewrite the constitution. And so James Madison, who really wasn't in favor of amendments, at least not initially said, no, we need to draft amendments 
so we can do it. And he commences his fabulous colleagues to do that. And so the, the men who drafted the Bill of Rights didn't actually think the Bill of Rights was necessary. Um, so that's sort of interesting, but, but it's also revealing and important because um, part of my argument at least is that the, the, the language of the First Amendment drafted is not altogether clear and precise. And you ask, well, how could they draft constitutional text that's not clear and not precise? Well, the answer is the men who drafted this First Amendment didn't actually think it was necessary. They were just trying to pass amendments. Uh, everyone was like, oh, a national government should establish religion. We agree with that. Shouldn't violate the free exercise of religion. Shouldn't do that. We don't really need to clarify what these terms mean. We just need to pass amendments because we said we would. So this sort of forgotten history actually has very important implications when we're trying to understand the text of the Constitution today. Sorry, that was a very long answer to a great question. I, I apologize for going on so long. So, Philip, as we dive into the First Amendment, people sometimes say to me, there's five freedoms in the First Amendment. And I say, there's six rights in the First Amendment. Maybe there's five freedoms. Yeah. But can I cite Dr. Philip Munoz for my argument that there's six rights in the First Amendment? Well, I don't know. You have to list them out for me. What are the six you have in mind? Well, I was thinking of speech and press assembly and petition. And then the two that we're about to get into, I'm saying establishment of religion is, per, is different from free exercise. Do, do I win that argument that establishment is different from free exercise? Well, yes and no. Maybe more no than yes. Um, the reason we don't establish a religion is because it, uh, establishments tend to violate free exercise. So the, the principle, the, the real right is religious free exercise. Uh, Non-establishment is a, a vehicle or means by which to secure the right of, of free exercise. So um, there's no individual right of non-establishment. That doesn't, the, the terms don't really make sense because um, Establishments are relationship between churches and government. They're not, they're not, um, it's an institutional relationship. It's not an individual right. So I'm afraid I think you more, you're more wrong than right. Uh, though uh -oh. establishment is, um, non-establishment is one of the principal ways we secure the right of religious free exercise. Thank you. So rights. Your, your book really lays out a lot about what we mean with natural rights, inalienable or unalienable rights, inherent rights. What did the founders think when they were talking about these different rights? Yeah, well, let's, let's just start with the basic concept of the idea of natural rights. So this is language that we're very familiar with. We talk about natural rights all the time. And what exactly do we mean by that? Um, what what is what work is the word natural doing? Um, you know, are there unnatural rights? Or what does that mean? So uh, natural rights are are different from um, the term they use is acquired rights. A natural right is a right you have on accordance of your your human nature. Uh, so natural rights are um, not granted by the government the government recognizes or respects natural rights but you have those rights before the existence of government or uh, government is illegitimate if it fails to respect our natural rights we have them on account of our human nature our inherent human dignity you could say that god endows us with certain rights that's you know the founder's language from the declaration so whether you understand it as uh, the rights coming from god or on account of our on account of our human nature and the, the inherent dignity for the founders, those things were the same. We, um, the, uh, uh, the creator God is a God of nature, so we can understand um, our natural rights by thinking and reflecting on human nature and the dignity contained in human nature. Um, so natural rights are natural in the sense that they're not a product of the state. Uh, the right to serve on a jury, for example, is not a natural right. It's a civil right, very important civil right, but it's a right that's really granted and recognized from the government. Natural rights are um, recognized but not granted or um, created by government. 
And how about the difference between an alienable or an inalienable or unalienable right? Yeah, yeah. We, we say inalienable with an I. The founders uh, use the term unalienable with a U. It's, it's all the same. Um, yeah, so what's the difference between an inalienable right and an alienable right? Um, let me just say we've now entered the grounds of a PhD seminar. You know, this is um, somewhat technical and um, uh, more sophisticated thinking. Um, let me see if I can explain it in a very simple way. Um, there are alienable natural rights and there are inalienable natural rights. Well, in, in some sense, you, we alienate our natural rights. Well, what, what does that mean? It doesn't mean we give them up and they disappear. It, it means that we turn authority over to the government to protect them, right? So government is created to protect our natural rights, but so we endow the government with, with power and then the government protects our rights. It's not that we don't exchange power for the rights. We own the rights already. We create government as our, uh, uh, we charter a government um, uh, to protect our rights. Now we don't give government authority over all of our natural rights. Some rights we retain, that is, we don't give jurisdiction to the government over them. A very simple example might um, help. Uh, the right to revolution, which is a natural right, to throw off a tyrannical government, that's what we said we were doing to the King of England, that's an inalienable natural right. The government doesn't secure your right to revolution. And if you just think through the terms, that's impossible. How Revolution is against the government. But the nature of the right to revolution is an inalienable right. Does that make sense? That, um, the yeah, right. That, yeah, religious. We cannot liberty. give, sometimes we give a right to the government. Yeah, we give authority. Yeah, we give authority or authority. jurisdiction. Yeah. But other rights. Yeah. Yeah. Such as property. We give the right to property to the government. Yeah, to, so to control it. Yeah. And so just simply this sounds sophisticated. It's not that it's not actually that sophisticated. It's not that difficult. Just think, um, when do you have a contract, right? So Patrick and I wanna, you know, I, Patrick's gonna sell something, I'm gonna buy it. We have an agreement. Um, if we have a verbal agreement, is that an agreement? Is that a contract? Like when we have a natural right to, I have a natural right to acquire property. Patrick has a right, right, a natural right to his property is to sell his property. And so to secure the, my right to acquire property and Patrick's right to sell his property, we facilitate laws about contracts. And we say, no, a verbal agreement is not sufficient to have a binding contract. You have to sign a document that say it has to be notarized or in some ways made official. Like we have agreements, right? So we are still exercising our rights to property, but we give government power to exercise jurisdiction over property rights to facilitate our use of them. So the government says, no, you have an agreement when you sign this official piece of paper, that's when you have an agreement. And therefore, if I don't pay Patrick, he can sue me, et cetera, et cetera. So this is government, we're creating government, government is securing our right to buy and exchange property. Government has jurisdiction over property. That's an alienable natural right. An inalienable natural right is, well, we, it's a right that we don't give government authority over. So for example, um, the subject of my book, as Patrick was just putting up the cover, um, my right to religious free exercise, the government says, is an inalienable right. Well, what does that mean? Uh, I have a right to worship, but government doesn't have a right to tell me how to worship. This is when you're doing proper worship. A government can legitimately tell you if you want to sell property or buy property, this is how you exchange property. But a government can't tell me how this is how you exchange um, or how you communicate or how you fulfill your religious obligations. Government doesn't have any authority over our religious obligations. We don't give government the power to say this is legitimate worship, this is illegitimate worship. You know, this, these are proper priests, these are you know, improper priests, these are blasphemy. You know, things you can't say, these are, we don't, literally, we don't give government that sort of power because our rights of religious worship are inalienable. Philip, I've got a really important question. <laughs> what are you not trying to do? When I open this up, this is an incredible 
over 200 pages detailed footnoted about what the founders thought about religious liberty. What are you not trying to do? Yeah, well, I mean, thank you uh, for the kind words about the book. Yeah, you know, all the book is trying to do is explain the founders' thinking. Uh, so, I, uh, the book will be successful if, if your question is, what did the founders mean when they said we have an inalienable natural right to religious liberty, uh, and why did they believe that? I'm just trying to explain. This is uh, what the founders meant by those terms, by those philosophical concepts. Um, this is why they thought that. I, I talk about the founders, um, the, the philosophical reasonings that led to the founders' beliefs in the natural right to religious liberty, their theological Protestant Christian beliefs that led to um, their confidence that we have an inalienable natural right to religious liberty. I'm just trying to explain uh, these philosophical concepts and theological concepts. Whether or not we um, should follow the founders today, that's a different question. My goal is simply to provide understanding. And my argument here is, um, I think the founders are, were quite wise. You know, I, a, a lot of people kind of disregard the founders today because for whatever reason. Uh, my argument is much simpler in a way. I say, well, let's figure out what they said and what they thought. And if we can figure out what they said and thought, then we can evaluate them. And some things we might like, some things we might not like. Uh, my job is not to convince anyone to follow the founders or to reject the founders. It really is just to try to say, hey, these are the, the founding ideals and principles of our constitution. And once we understand them better, then we can evaluate them. And maybe we like some things and maybe we don't like some things. Um, that's not my job uh, is to tell us whether we should like the founders or not. It's my job to present them at least the best I can. You know, I'm sure I get some things wrong. I think we're going to jump in a little bit to the establishment and maybe even more so the free exercise clause. I do want to encourage attendees, if you want to probe on some of the things Philip Munoz is saying, please use that chat feature and, and we can see that and we can try to either collate some of those questions or, or not. So uh, Philip didn't really want to get into current cases. And then today happened. Well, I guess we knew last week today was going to happen. So all over the news is, um, I think the way you say it is 303 Creative LLC versus Alanis, which if I can, I'll, I'll give my, try to summarize it. There's a web designer in Colorado. And she says she has a right to not do web designs for same-sex couples because of her Christian beliefs. There's a Colorado um, anti-discrimination law. So we've got the individual versus the state. And it was argued in the Supreme Court today. Um, did, did I lay out the basics a little bit okay, Philip? Yeah, I think, I think those are the essential facts. Now, I, I have to confess, I haven't read the briefs and I didn't listen to oral arguments today, you know. Um, but I think, yeah, as far as I understand it, there's a web designer and um, I'm guessing here, I'm, I'm not quite sure, you know, um, uh, I guess the same sex couple asked her to design a wedding website, I think it was. And uh, she I'm did. not even sure if that happened. There may be a little bit of an argument of has she even been harmed yet? Uh, yeah. like, I haven't. What, I haven't. I like, don't know the facts. I mean, uh, um, as I like to tell my colleagues, I'm, I'm better at predicting Supreme Court decisions after they happen. Um, but, you know, these this type of case is um, kind of all over the place right now. So, And so I guess to tie back to sort of what would the founders do mm -hmm. in, in a free exercise and or free speech case, I think it's arguably both. The Supreme Court will tell us which they think it is. Should the court, should those nine men and women be concerned about what the founders thought? or could they be overly concerned about it? Yeah, well, you know, um, the way I approach these things is to say, well, if you're going to use the founders, make sure you at least get them right. You know, so whether, whether or not the founders should interpret the free exercise clause or the free speech clause according to the founders view, you know, that's a question of jurisprudence and, you know, I have opinions on that. Um, but let's just say they are going to consult the founders if they consult the founders, they should get the founders correct. 
right? Uh, the founders are uh, standing in as an authority for the meaning of the Constitution. And if you um, appeal to that authority, but misunderstand the authority, you're effectively changing the Constitution. You know, you're getting it wrong. Now, whether or not we turn to the founders, I mean, I, I have some sympathies with the originalists, but originalists don't really like my argument. So they don't think I'm an originalist because ultimately my argument is really, we should only found, follow the founders if the founders give us a good constitution. I mean, that's, that's my position. Um, if the, if the, but we can't simply say, well, because, the, because they were white or because um, they wrote 200 plus years ago, it's a bad constitution. I mean, you have to read what they said. Maybe some parts are good and some parts are bad, uh, right? So I, I don't immediately accept the founders or disregard them. I think we have to see what they said. And I heard you once describe the difference in natural rights by comparing Thomas Hobbes and Alexander Hamilton. And I, I just, I think that illustrates the point of when we appeal to the founders, is even that, is that just too broad a term that we put a umbrella or dome over all the founders when they actually had a lot of disagreements? Well, that's right. So the founders, you know, had significant political disagreements. Um, so you, it, sometimes it's hard just to talk about the founders. And I have a whole chapter devoted in my book to devoted to how the founders disagreed about the separation of church and state. So um, again, you don't want to, we paint with too broad of a brush usually, whether to praise the founders or disregard them. Um, we have to under, try to understand the principles of the founding and where the founders agreed, understand their agreements, and then understand their differences. Um, in some ways, their differences are even more interesting than their agreements because we try to we can learn from their differences. Why did they disagree? You know, why did James Madison and George Washington disagree on, on government support of religion? And what are the arguments they used? And then we can you know, learn from those arguments today. Um, so I, I guess I try not to be dogmatic in any way, um, uh, but look as the as look at the founders as potential sources of wisdom. But you know, with their own faults, they're just men. You know, uh, they're all men. They're, they make mistakes just like we make mistakes today. So I'm um, I'm talking to you from my house in Charlottesville, Virginia, Philip. I'm literally closer to Thomas Jefferson's Monticello than James Madison's Montpelier, where I work. And nobody ever gets those two M's mixed up, I promise. Monticello, Montpelier, not even my mom, if she's listening, from Notre Dame. Uh, how would those two, how would Madison and Jefferson have disagreed about either free exercise or establishment clause or natural rights? Yeah, yeah, well, very good. Well, let me, let me just say, I, I have a long relationship with Montpelier, it shows where my loyalties lie among among uh, Jefferson and, and Madison, uh, um, uh, though I admire, I suppose, both men. Um, well, here's a concrete example. Um, uh, Jefferson wrote a draft constitution. Uh, gosh, I, I think it's for Kentucky. I, my memory's uh, failing me right now, but he wrote a draft constitution. I believe it was for Kentucky. And it was sent, that draft constitution for Kentucky was sent to James Madison. Apologies if I got the state wrong. And um, Madison was asked, well, what do you think of this draft constitution? And uh, Madison, you know, said, oh, that's pretty good. Uh, but Jefferson put in some uh, religious tests for office. Uh, clergy could not hold elected office. They couldn't be in the state house or state senate or the governor. And Madison said that that violates a fundamental principle of religious liberty. There should be no civil I'm sorry, civil disabilities on account of religious affiliation. You can't ban clergymen from holding office, uh, Madison said. Uh, he thought that was unfair religious discrimination. Um, and so that's one point of disagreement between uh, Madison and Jefferson. Uh, you know, arguably Jefferson was contradictory to his own principles uh, of the Virginia statute of religious liberty. You know. Uh, there, there are other differences uh, apart from uh, religious liberty. You know, Jefferson was um, maybe more optimistic than Madison, more of a progressive. Jefferson had lots of faith in the future. So, you know, Jefferson um, 
so that all laws should expire every 19 years, sort of sunset laws, um, because the, the, the dead should not govern the living. You know, if they're good laws, then, you know, the, the next generation would repass them. And one can appreciate that. It's very democratic in a sense. Uh, but Madison thought, this is crazy. <laughs> like, you know, um, it does, it, Jefferson was too optimistic about our ability to get along and agree. And if you get the laws right, especially constitutional laws, um, stability in the law is uh, a feature of a good constitution. Uh, he writes about this extensively in the Federalist Papers. That's why we need a Senate, and um, that's why the Constitution is hard to amend. So this is a, maybe even a more significant difference between Madison. Madison, I think, was much uh, more sober than Jefferson when it came to politics, at least. I, I'll, I'll have a yeah. colleague who would say, you want to talk about the beauty of an idea, you, you talk to Thomas Jefferson. You yeah. want to talk about how to make it work, you talk to James Madison. You know, I like that. Not a guy. There's a lot of truth. Uh, and I think when you were talking about the politics of not having a second convention, the pragmatism of a Madison of we just got through this convention, we, we barely got out of there while while you were in France, Thomas. Um, yeah. You know, maybe we shouldn't do this again. And, and politically, um, we get that that idea you gave us of the people who got the Bill of Rights pushed through, led by James Madison, didn't think you needed one. Yeah, you know, and Madison wrote, I mean, he was, um, you know, at first he was against the Bill of Rights, but he wasn't against it in principle. He didn't really think it was needed with the rest of his fellows because the structure of the Constitution, he said, you know, the Bill of Rights are like parchment barriers, you know, they're, they're paper thin, they're, they'll, they, they'll be ignored. But he also worried that, well, if we try to draft a Bill of Rights, we won't get them right because um, the people might not under, you know, the draft, the people who are drafting the rights might make them too small or too large. That is, they won't understand natural rights properly. Um, so he was very leery of the enterprise. Um, uh, and I think that comes in part from his um, being at the Constitutional Convention and you know, he thought the he thought the Constitution was good and worthy of being adopted, but he thought there were some real problems with it as well. It's hard to draft constitutions. I mean, look, if you, our our recent history has taught us anything as a nation, it's 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 easy to tear down things. It's much easier to tear down things than it is to build them back up, especially when you're talking about um, political governments. And I think um, I do think Madison understood that more clearly than Jefferson. So. I, I can't avoid asking you about the comparison with George Mason. I think we've got some listeners from Northern Virginia, the DC area, George Mason from Fairfax County right there on the Potomac. And um, Madison's just 25 when he meets them uh, there in Williamsburg and George Mason's draft in June of 1776 says, all men should enjoy the fullest toleration in the exercise of religion. He's got this Virginia Declaration of Rights. It's before the Declaration of Independence. All men should enjoy the fullest toleration in the exercise of religion. Can you tell us how 25-year-old Madison helps him out? Yeah, it, it's, uh, thanks for asking that. I, you know, I first read about this when I was 25 uh, as a graduate student. And uh, I have to say, I'm reading this, I'm like, oh, James Madison is, you know, helping to draft the Virginia Declaration of Rights. And I'm sitting here as a poor graduate student. I haven't, I haven't done anything with my life. You know, I'm so far behind. Um, so, yeah, Madison is a young guy. And um, so the context here is um, uh, the, the nation's leaders, uh, before we declare independence in 1776, I think, this is May 1776, they basically send a message to the states saying, hey, we're going to declare independence. You should think about drafting a new constitution for your state. And uh, many of the states do this. There's this um, uh, incredible energy when it comes to drafting constitutions. And many of the states uh, preface their constitutions or add to their constitutions a declaration of rights. And these state, state level declaration of rights are not quite the same as our federal bill of rights. Um, in some states, they're not even the same thing as, they're not even technically part of the Constitution. They're statements of political principles. 
And that's so the Virginia Declaration of Rights is the very first of these. It's adopted in uh, May 1776, if memory serves me right. And uh, there are 16 articles. And they're, they're sort of statements of first principles. And as you mentioned, Mason says, uh, drafts the first draft of Article 16, which pertains to religion. And he says, you know, the fullest toleration. And, and Madison, the young James Madison, you know, takes his red pen out and says, uh, not toleration. We don't speak about toleration anymore. Um, and we, we tend to f forget what toleration means. Toleration properly understood uh, in the technical sense of the term or the clear meaning of the term, you tolerate things you disagree with, right? So I tolerate my five-year-old's fussiness, you know, because she had a hard day, she's hungry, you know, mom cooked dinner that she didn't like, whatever, you know, so I, I tolerate it. Um, I tolerate my children's misbehavior, I tolerate my students turning in their papers late. Um, that is, I have authority over these things and I don't like the behavior. In fact, I, I have a sort of moral disapproval of the behavior, but I'll let you indulge it. And Madison says, no, that's not right when it comes to religion and religious exercises. Individuals have a right of religious free exercise. It's not the business of government to tolerate that which they disagree with. And, and what Madison is driving at is that religious liberty, as we started with, is an inalienable natural right. So there's a question in the chat, and it's partly about the Second Amendment, and, and you may want to Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, go see. there, but but also just the First Amendment of uh, I think the question's trying to get at the fact that there's different views and even different Federalist views on the Bill of Rights. Does does the fact that there's different views on the need for a Bill of Rights does that make it harder for us to then say how they might apply today? Well, you have to look at it every provision itself right so uh the third amendment you know no quartering of soldiers um, you, you, the government can't house soldiers in your in your house you know they can't put soldiers in your house it's so some provisions are relatively clear um others are less clear and um again this is this is one of those areas where people speak too broadly uh, they say oh we can't really understand any of the amendments um well, go, you got to go clause by clause and figure out which ones you can understand and which ones you can't. It, and it might be true that there's some we don't know the meaning of. Um, so uh, you, you can't give one answer for every amendment. You can't even give one answer for every the different parts of the First Amendment. Some things we can have some relatively precise knowledge of and we can actually know the founders' minds. Other things they left unclear. So again, this gets back to me, to my point. You just can't you can't be dogmatic about these things. You just have to do the history. And, and sometimes the history doesn't yield results. So, you know, the critics of originalism have a point. You know, some, sometimes we can't know what exactly what the founders had in mind. You, you can't start from that conclusion, but it might be a legitimate conclusion. So let me see. The, the question on the Second Amendment here is, uh, let me just read it here so everyone can hear. To what extent did the Federalist ambivalence regarding development of the Bill of Rights lead to current frustrations, at least as some understand it, involving the language of the Second Amendment. Well, that's interesting. So um, to what extent is the, sec the, the clear original meaning of the Second Amendment, to what extent does it have to do with federalism is one of the questions, uh, or is there a, a right, uh, an individual right to bear arms? Um, not a uh, I don't know the history of the drafting of the Second Amendment too well. Um, I said, I think there are two things probably going on. I, I say this tentatively. Um, I think the founders believed in a natural right of self-defense. To what extent that led to bearing of arms? Um, I think you you had a right to defend yourself. But the founder, the whole structure of natural rights is that there can be reasonable regulation of our rights as well. I, the, the real problem with our Second Amendment debate is we don't understand that all natural rights have natural limits. We think if you have, let me just use speech for example. I mean this, we don't at all understand the founders' conceptions of what a right is. 
And that, that actually is the underlying problem with our Second Amendment debate. Uh, let me use free speech. Um, we say we have a right to free speech, but that doesn't mean you can say anything. You can't, you, have, you don't have a right to say false things about a person, that is to libel someone, right? To know something is false and then um, you know, to knowingly say false things that harm someone's reputation, that's libel, rough definition of libel. That's not part of the right of free speech. Right. So natural rights, to go back to Alexander Hamilton, are part of the natural law, and therefore natural rights have natural limits. We all understand this. And so your, the general way the founders would thought, think about the right to bear arms is you certainly have a right to self-defense. That might include the right to bear a firearm, um, but that right can be regulated in reasonable ways so as not to cause harm to others. What those precise regulations are, it's going to be determined by the legislature. This is the structure of how the founders thought about natural rights. The right to bear arms is not an inalienable right. We do give government authority to regulate these things. Maybe I could tie that Second Amendment question back to religious liberty and Madison. Sure. When Madison proposes the Second Amendment on June 8th, what becomes the Second Amendment on June 8th? He says, uh, he uses essentially the same words, the, the right of um, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep, keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Those are basically his words, a couple of them changed. And then he says, if you have a religious objection, you don't have to bear arms. And I don't know if this ties into your um, exemption understanding language. Like he puts the right to keep and bear arms and then Madison writes in an objection. That of course doesn't make it through the House and the Senate. It doesn't get sent to the states. But where does that play in terms of what the founders would do? Where would that play in terms of how we should interpret either religious liberty or second amendment? Yeah, well, so, okay, so let, let me back up a little bit. The, one of the big questions regarding the First Amendment free exercise clause is um, do religious believers have a right to be exempt from laws that they find burdensome? So a classic example or the classic example is pacifists, Quakers who are pacifists, do they have a right not to serve in the army or to bear arms? And so here's, there's an interesting fact about the drafting of this, what becomes the Second Amendment. Uh, originally, as, as you just mentioned, um, there's an exemption in the Second Amendment for Quakers for not having to bear arms. And um, what I find interesting about that is the, the question of exemption uh, from generally applicable laws occurs in the context of the Second Amendment debate, not in the context of the First Amendment debate. Well, if, if the First Amendment was understood to give Quakers an exemption. That is, if the right to free exercise included an exemption, why would, when they drafted the Second Amendment, that start talking about exemptions? Why wouldn't they have said, oh, we already took care of the exemption problem when we drafted the First Amendment? And as a matter of fact, they draft, they debate the meaning of the First Amendment in the morning and debate the meaning of the Second Amendment in the afternoon. And no one in the Second Amendment debate says, hey, but we drafted what became the First Amendment, and therefore there's no need for an exemption. And I take this, you know, it's not solid evidence, really. It's not drop dead, you know, decides everything evidence. But I take this um, Second Amendment debate over exemptions to suggest at least that the original meaning of the First Amendment free exercise clause does not include a right to an exemption. Um, again, this is um, you know, uh, graduate level work or, you know, very esoteric law school level work, but it could have possible implications for the meaning of the First Amendment and our understanding of what the right of free exercise means. So, it, you know, it's, it's not an important, uh, it's a small piece of evidence about the original meaning of the free exercise clause. So I take it to mean, uh, my, the interpretation I set forth in the book is, if that's not clear, is that the founders didn't believe the right of free exercise meant that religious individuals get an exemption from otherwise valid laws. Uh, this is a relatively controversial uh, interpretation 
uh, today, at least for those who um, try to understand the founders. I, I love the way you're able to dialogue about these things and something at Montpelier, we try so hard to do um, in terms of dialoguing and, and Philip admitting, you know, people disagree with some of these views sometimes. Um, sword or shield. Sometimes our rights are called a uh, sword. Sometimes they're called a shield. Are they both right? Are they both wrong? Wh wh what should I think about religious liberty and the First Amendment and sword or shield? Yeah, yeah. I don't know if it's either a sword or shield. Um, you know, um, uh, you know, it, it, I, I'm sorry, I haven't really thought this through in these terms. I mean, uh, the idea of amendments being a shield suggests, um, you know, there's some things that government can't do to us. I think there's a lot of truth to that. Um, uh, the, I, and I think that's true when it comes to uh, the idea of an inalienable natural right. You know, we don't give government authority over certain things. So a shield is, um, uh, I suppose, uh, not improper. I don't know that I quite like the metaphor. Um, but a shield from what is the real question? It, 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 the, the proper, it's not that... <laughs> The content of what we're being shielded from is more important than the image of a shield. Right. So, um, yeah, go ahead. Shield from the government, right? A shield from and the government. That's right. It's maybe a simple question. I, I think I know the answer, but which government, now that we've got the 14th Amendment and incorporation doctrine from the court, when we say a right to religious liberty, does it not matter which government? Is it federal, state, local that we're always, if there's a right, the courts will recognize we're always protected in that right? Yeah, yeah. So this is, you know, to what extent can the, the Bill of Rights be applied against the states? I think is a very interesting question and an important one. And I think here the free exercise clause and the establishment clause are a little bit different. So, um, the free exercise clause, at least as best that I can understand it, uh, protects an inalienable natural right. And therefore, um, even though the original meaning of the free exercise clause and the Bill of Rights as a whole was only to apply and to limit what the national government could do, to extend that protection to against, against the state governments isn't revolutionary. In fact, most states at the time of the founding have the equivalent of a free exercise clause as well. So state constitutions protected the same right, which should not be surprising because if f religious free exercise is an inalienable natural rights, you would expect all levels of government, right, as long as we're motivated by the same natural rights thinking to have that same protection. So the incorporation of the First Amendment free exercise clause to apply against the states, I, I think is not problematic. Uh, the establishment clause is a little bit different and we've touched on these issues when we we're talking about the Second Amendment. The Establishment Clause has peculiar language. Um, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. If I said uh, Congress shall make no law respecting abortion, well, what, what would that mean? Congress shall make no law respecting abortion. Well, who can make laws on the subject of abortion then? Well, we all understand, well, the, the states. Right? If I said Congress shall make no law respecting abortion, is that a pro-life or a pro-choice provision? Well, neither. It's actually, it's a federalism provision. We're going to keep the national government out of this issue and we're going to turn it over to the states. So when, when the First Amendment, when they drafted the First Amendment and said Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, what they were saying is whatever an establishment is, that's a state level question. And I think that that's and if you read the debates in the first Congress, you see that people didn't want um, to interfere with what was going on in the states. Now, there's disagreement among the states. That's why they didn't want to interfere. Look, we don't want to settle the proper relationship between church and state and all these other ways that don't involve the natural rights. Let every state figure that out for themselves. 
Now, how can you incorporate a federalism provision to apply to apply against the states? It, it's like applying the 10th Amendment to the states. It's not, it doesn't work. No. Uh, my guess right now is that half our audience is like, I have no idea what Professor Munoz just said. It's, it just means, um, the, well, you gotta spend some time with this. <laughs> the establishment or, was to protect state authority, and now the court has said uh, that the establishment clause limits state authority, and that that's to change the meaning of the First Amendment. So while they're while the audience is typing in their questions, because we've got less than ten minutes left, um, so you, you got to get in there. I'm going to ask them for a quote. And you know I'm going to be biased. So while you're typing in your question, Philip, favorite James Madison quote? Oh, gosh, that's a hard one. Um, favorite James Madison quote? Gosh, I've never been asked that question before. Um, well, ask me your next quote. I'm going to ruminate over that for just a second. That's a good uh, All right. The book is dedicated to your wife, Jennifer. What's her favorite part of the book? <laughs> you, you, you presume that she's read it. <laughs> <laughs> that, it that it's done. Is that her favorite? <laughs> you know, you know. There's a part that I know. What uh, I know. So I there's an example. Um, I'm trying to explain natural rights and inalienable natural rights. This is one of your first question. What's an inalienable natural right? And uh, the first time I drafted that part of the chapter, I can't even remember what chapter. I think it's in chapter two, but. Um, it was very abstract. Um, I've probably been too abstract today, and I apologize for that. Uh, and uh, I think, as my wife said, you gotta, you gotta get some examples. I have no idea what you're talking about. You gotta get some examples in here. And so I have, I use a fisher, uh, fisherman example. Uh, you know, people catching three, three individuals catching fish. Uh, and uh, the three individuals in the book, I, I name them Dominic, uh, Madeline, and Sophie. And they. They have an argument about how many fish you can catch. So this is how we explain the idea of natural rights. Well, so the, I have three children who are very quarrelsome with one another. So the example reflects the actual Munoz household. I have three kids who are very concerned with justice and the injustice being done to them. Uh, I, um, I was going through law school when I had a son, so uh, I can understand um, the, the things that may have leaked out as he was being raised. Um, we've got a question. I have an answer to your first question. Um, on the, I, I'm not gonna give you a favorite, let me give you a favorite Federalist paper, how about that? I think, I think that's Federalist 49. It's a very oh. interesting paper where Madison talks about the need for reverence for the Constitution. It's just a side of James Madison that we don't hear sometimes. I actually think, uh, I've been thinking about this a lot. I'm teaching a course on Abraham Lincoln. And I think, in a way, in Federalist 49, uh, uh, Madison foreshadows, and not only the Gettysburg Address, but the second, Lincoln's second inaugural, about the need for a deep admiration of our Constitution, at least in those parts where it's good. So I'd say Federalist 49 is my favorite part of it. Okay, so my goal is in two years, I think it's 49 and you think it's 51. Um, cause I'm going to say if men were angels, no government would be necessary. And if angels were to govern men, no internal or external controls on government would be necessary. Yeah. Uh, maybe mine gets to a question from North Carolina about the scope and size of government. Is there anything in the scope and size or size of today's government that Madison and other founders, so we may get some disagreement here, might object to? Anything that would they would see as deficient. Uh, that's interesting that they would object in terms of, I think, too much, but anything deficient in scope and size. Yeah, well, uh, I mean, the, we should keep in mind that uh, this is one of Madison's point, so that liberty can be protected for, from too weak a government or from not enough government, as much as it can be from too much government. The articles were too weak and therefore rights were not being protected. Um, uh, is there anything in the scope? <laughs> well, yeah, I, all sorts of things that I they think would be problematic. Uh, uh, I don't think um, they would like our Federal Reserve or the fact that we're not that we don't have a stable currency that we're not on the gold standard or some fixed standard. Um, I think they would have see that as deeply immoral and problematic, to be honest. 
Um, they would see it as immoral. Yeah, wow. because if you inflate, if you intentionally inflate money, you're transferring from A to B. This was a huge problem at the time of the founding. Uh, inflation was, um, and that you should have sound money. Uh, and we don't have sound money right now. And that gives tremendous authority to government to manipulate the currency. Um, that's just a matter of justice. The, the money should be stable. Now, modern economists would say, well, I've just rejected Keynesian economics and all, and all that in central, you know. Um, but I think, yeah, they, they thought, you know, this was a, a problem for them. Um, that's probably not the example you're, you're looking for. Um, you know, our, our protection of property rights, you know, you, I, I, I don't see this, um, you know, the Supreme Court case you mentioned about the website designer. Um, they wouldn't think this is a religious freedom case. I think they'd say, I have two thoughts, or maybe more, but um, uh, I think they would probably say, look, um, it doesn't harm anyone not to do business with them. Now, maybe you should do business with everyone. Maybe you should just learn to leave people alone. You know, that, that might have been a founder's view you're saying. Yeah, yeah. You know, just be, you actually should just be more tolerant of people. You know, let, let just, um, you know, in a way, both sides need to be more tolerant of, you know, just look, okay, we won't agree on everything. We, you know, lots of things, you know, well, just don't bother people. I think that's actually their more general disposition. I think, you know, we're, um, I think they would think uh, we're too puritanical on both sides. We'll get along with it if we just agree to disagree and not, you know, and leave people alone. I actually think that's James Madison's position. I, I, I have to agree that desire to dialogue and, and not, um, not that we're always going to win an argument, but we're going to talk about something. And I guess my worry in today's political world is that these Supreme Court's cases will be seen as winners and losers. There was a winner and there was a loser. And to a lot of extent, that's true. But I also think that they're balancing interest. And, and I think the reason this case got to the Supreme Court today or other religious liberty cases, um, how much can the court be, uh, can the government be involved in religious schools? You know, what's too much? There's a balance there. Yeah, I, and, I think that's right. I think Madison would have expected that balance to be done in the legislative chamber, right? So, um, and not in the judiciary. So there's there's lots of room for balancing. It's to be done in the legislative chamber. I'll, I'll say one other thing. Uh, this gets to Federalist Ten, the famous Federalist Ten. Um, I tell you one thing. Madison would would abhor is all the exemptions in our laws and our tax code and our laws in general. Um, Madison believes this is in Federalist Ten, Federalist Fifty One, but also in Federalist Fifty Seven. The equal application of the law. Right. The law applies to everyone the same is a foundational principle of the rule of law, the foundational principle of the law being a good law. Right. He says in Federalist 57, um, the surest way to I'm paraphrasing here, the surest way to make sure that the House of Representatives or our representatives make good laws is that they themselves have to follow the law, they and their friends. Our, our, our tax code, our legal code is littered with exemptions. And I think Madison would say this is deeply problematic. It actually violates the fundamental principle of equality. Whatever the law is, we should all be subject to it the same. And if we can't subject everyone to the law, then maybe we shouldn't pass a law in the first place. Well, I've got to give a bunch of thanks, Philip, uh, to our sponsor, Virginia Law Foundation, to our attendees tuning in, and especially for you, Philip, um, you've spent time at Montpelier before. You've helped us understand Madison and, and indeed the founders in his context. And, and this is just a great um, blessing to us. I hope some of the attendees will come visit us at Montpelier. I hope we get you back uh, on campus in Central Virginia sometime to just dialogue these things. Uh, that's one thing 
maybe I'll ask you a final question. Wouldn't the founders agree that if we're dialoguing about these things, we're, we're maybe making progress, that we're actually listening to each other? This is one of the reasons that Madison wanted these questions not to actually be uh, settled by the court, but in the legislative chamber, because the legislative chamber is, a, is the people's chamber. Um, because what is self-government but deliberation upon, on the common good, and arguing back and forth, and your side will win some, and your side will lose some, and then we, you know, you know, then the founders would say, then you should go to the tavern and have a drink and then come back the next day and argue it uh, once again, you know. So now let me just say thank you um, uh, to you. Uh, really great and thoughtful questions. I hope I hope the listeners have enjoyed our conversation, uh, but to Montpelier and uh, for keeping the idea, uh, James Madison and his ideas, um, you know, relevant to us in the 21st century. So it's a real pleasure to, to be with you this evening. Thank you, Philip. Um, please come out and visit us at Montpelier. Um, uh, the landscape, the, the archaeology, the descendant community, the house, it's, um, it's a great place to engage. Thank you so much. And we'll sign off until next time. Thank you, everyone. Good night.